welcome back, friends, to our Life Group series, Unveil. And we're going to jump right into our key text in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you were a part of the first session, you'll remember that Paul the Apostle is talking about when Moses came uh, to meet with the people wearing a veil to hide the glory that had uh, just radiated on his countenance from being in God's presence. Mm -hmm. Verse 14 says this, talking about the people of Israel, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Mm. Now, the veil they're talking about obviously is not the same uh, artifact that <laughs> Moses actually wore over his face. He's giving an illustration here. He's saying there's a veil that covers over their hearts. Right. And, and so we can kind of expand on this idea of the veil for a little bit. Right. Because when Moses did come down off the mountain, shared this with them, had the veil over his face. In fact, God gave him a command to build a tabernacle, mm -hmm. to build a place where God's presence and power would dwell and uh, gave them a lot of specifics on how they were going to go into God's presence mm -hmm. and how they were to come out of God's presence. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see this picture of a veil because the veil was the final barrier, basically, mm -hmm. between the people of God and God's actual presence, the most holy of holies. Yeah. And so in the tabernacle there, the veil was the curtain. Mm -hmm. It was the curtain that, that separated the holy of holies, right. that place where God's presence dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant. Right. And, and, and nobody went beyond the veil. Exactly. And then, of course, when Solomon comes along and builds the temple. Yep. He gets the instructions, and there, again, is a veil. A massive veil. A huge, <laughs> thick curtain. Right. And and no one goes uh, beyond the veil except the high priest right. and only at Yom Kippur. Just once a year, he goes in to make atonement for the people. And so, so we see those veils until... Finally, we see the, the fulfillment of the removing of the veil right. depicted at the cross. Right. When it talks about Christ being the, the only one who can remove the veil, yeah. it, it says in Matthew uh, chapter 27, verse 51, at that moment, this is the moment that Jesus died on the cross. Yeah. At that moment, the curtain of the temple, which was this veil, was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, it's an incredible feat for it to be torn, first of all, from top to bottom. This was a massive curtain. Mm -hmm. But really what this showed was the the access that we now have yeah. to God's power and God's presence. That's it. What a, a beautiful picture, probably the greatest picture in all the Bible. Of, mm -hmm. uh, we have access through the veil to come into God's presence. And so we could just celebrate that. We could just stay there for a little while and talk about the power and the access we have. Right. But in this session, we, we don't want to rush past the veil because uh, although we don't live behind that veil anymore, let's not forget what it was there for. Right. Uh, the, the truth is the veil was there uh, to say, you can't come in here, mm. but but it was also there to say, you can't <laughs> yeah. come in here. It's dangerous. <laughs> like it was for not just for the, the separation of God's holiness, but for the protection of the people. Right. Like when you look back at, in the Old Testament at, at some of those stories, um, I mean, God made it <laughs> abundantly clear. And e even the, the priest, when they would when they would go in just once a year, that high priest would go in, uh, the hem of his garment would be covered with gold bells. That way the people would, they would hear the sound and know that he's making atonement for them. But uh, it was also a sound to indicate that he's still alive in there. <laughs> yeah. And he would have a rope tied around yeah. him. Just in case that, you know, that he did something wrong in yep. the presence of God and, and he could literally just be struck dead in that moment. They'd have to drag his body out. <laughs> yeah. And, and as crazy as that sounds, there's actually a story mm -hmm. that, that indicates in the Old Testament that God was serious enough about his presence yes. and the Ark of the Covenant that he wasn't playing games. Yeah, there's a guy named Uzzah. Uh, literally, King David is having the Ark of the Covenant brought back mm -hmm. after it had been taken. And as they're bringing it back, it says that that the Ark of the Covenant began to slip, basically began to fall. Yeah. And this guy Uzzah goes up and tries to stabilize it. Mm -hmm. So the minute he touches the Ark of the Covenant, he dies. Yeah. Right there on the spot. Party over. Yeah, that's how powerful. <laughs> and and in fact, this yeah. scares King David to the point where he's like, 
I don't want to bring it back into the city. <laughs> I'm just going to put it over here. Right. Um, but once they put it over into this other town, they find out that that town begins to be blessed and all these amazing things are happening. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? I do want God's presence. Yeah. And so they bring that back into the city. But over and over in scripture, we see this incredible reverence and holiness for the presence of God. Well, I think about even before the tabernacle was built uh, in Exodus 33, Moses said, God, I want to see your glory. Mm -hmm. And God basically said, you can't handle it. <laughs> yeah. He said, I'll, I'll tell you my name yeah. and I'll pass by you. I'll let my goodness go before you. Right. But I can't, no man can see the glory of God and live. Mm -hmm. And then in, in Solomon's day, when the temple was finally built right. and all the sacrifices were made, the Bible says the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It was so overwhelming. It says the priests could no longer perform their duties. Yeah. Like when God's presence showed up, it just kind of shut down everything. E everything. Yeah. And so there is a power and an awesomeness and a reverence that this veil teaches us. Yeah. And it's important that we don't forget that mm -hmm. when we're thinking about the fact that we have access to God's presence and God's power. You know, I was thinking about the fact of uh, different church traditions, mm -hmm. you know, um, when we're talking about reverence and holiness, I grew up Catholic and, um, you know, when I grew up, I, I just remember the priest was the one who was able to do certain things. There were certain rituals and ways things had to take place. Right. Or you, you couldn't go near certain things. The Eucharist, yeah. there was a special place where you kept the Eucharist. And mm -hmm. and uh, that's the, the bread and the juice, you right. know, the bread and the wine. And so there's certain... And it was wine. You were Catholic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a little different. But uh, but in that sense, though, there there was this this holiness and this reverence to the fact of like, listen, that that's that's almost untouchable. Yeah. Um, now we in our current tradition as a Pentecostal church, we don't live with the Eucharist behind there, and certainly everybody has access. But I have also recognized a weightiness of the presence of God as well. Yeah. There's a holiness. There's been some prayer meetings and times that we've had where there is a stillness that just comes over the room and you can mm. literally palpably feel the presence of God. Yeah. It's, you know, you talking about everybody having access and growing up in the church. I, I grew up in the church too. And, um, you know, communion Sunday meant uh, us pastors' kids had extra snacks after church. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but I also grew up in a church tradition where other people defined holiness different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the ladies, you know, would wear their hair in a beehive, and you know, the old <laughs> adage: the the higher the hive, the closer to God. You know, they <laughs> believed that. You know, and. Right. Um, you know, sometimes I think they thought the weightiness of God's glory was dependent on the weight of your Bible, <laughs> yeah. you know, some of the things yeah. that people would carry. But sometimes we attribute God's glory to a certain style of music. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, when we sing that song, you know, all of a sudden, like, oh, yeah, I feel God's presence. Or, uh, you know, some of the vernacular that we we talk in, you know, sometimes we, we, uh, we like to borrow from, like, the old English of the King James. Right. And, uh, just for no other reason, but it feels more reverent. Right. You know, the truth is uh, we can go too far the other way uh, where, you know, we, we see the slogans like, Jesus is my homeboy, mm. you know, or we refer to God as the big man upstairs. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, you know, while I thank God that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, right. personally, I'm not comfortable calling him my homeboy. Right. There, there's a sense of reverence and, and that's the balance that, that this curtain, this veil teaches us right. that we should never get so comfortable with uh, the Lord, our shepherd, that we forget he's the God almighty mm -hmm. who lives in unapproachable light. Yeah. And so uh, we'd love to just take some time to think about uh, what it looks like to reverence God's presence in, in your life and in, in, your, uh, in your personal relationship with the Lord and, and in our church. Well, I hope there is an appreciation in your life group uh, of a reverence for God and what that looks like in each of your lives. Yeah. Thank God that the veil has been removed, that we do have access into God's presence. Uh, but you know, the truth is, ever since that veil in the temple was destroyed, uh, on the moment you talked about earlier when Christ said, it is finished, and, right. and the veil was ripped top to bottom, ever since that moment, 
And even before that moment, the truth is we've been constructing more veils. Yeah. We've been putting up more barriers. And, and you see that even in, in the life of the church, you know, that, that veil that we talked about uh, separated the holy of holies from the holy place. If you weren't the high priest, you didn't get into the holy of holies. There was a, a, a wall of separation there. Uh, but that wasn't the only wall of separation. Mm-hmm. Outside of the Holy of Holies, there was a, a courtyard, and the court of the priest is, you know, where the regular priest could go. And, and if you were a devout Jewish man, well, you could go into the inner court. But if you were a devout Jewish woman, there was another barrier. You couldn't <laughs> go past the outer courts. Yeah. And so they had to go to the outer courts. But if you weren't a Jewish man or a Jewish woman and, and, and you were a Gentile, well, you had to even stay outside of that. You couldn't go past a place where the gate called Beautiful was. Yeah. And, and there was a wall there that literally divided those that could go in and worship and those that had to stay out. Right. Uh, in, in fact, historians tell us that there was a sign on that, on that wall that said, uh, you may not enter, you may not go past this point. Uh, and if you do, it's, it's on your own head that your death will ensue. Wow. And so it was, it was a stern warning not to go past that barrier wall. Yeah. And, and Paul, the apostle actually wrote about that barrier wall in Ephesians chapter two. Yeah. Ephesians chapter two, verse 14, for he himself, this is Jesus is our peace. Yes. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. There it is. He came and he separated the wall. You know, we were talking about the verse uh, before where the veil was ripped in two, but I love this this verse that says he didn't just rip the veil, he broke down the wall. Yeah, that's so good. He removed all the veils, mm-hmm. all the all the obstacles. Uh, through his own flesh so that we could come near to God. And it's so important to understand that he's writing this to a church who's trying to figure out, now, do Jews have different access to God than, mm-hmm. than Gentiles? And, right. and and maybe that's not what we're dealing with here today in your group or or in our country, for example, but but there are some walls that we begin to put up yeah. to try to keep people or, or decide what we feel is important and what's unimportant. And uh, there's a, a story that I was reading by Philip Yancey in his new book, Where the Light Fell. It's a memoir. It's talking about his life growing up uh, really as a, a hard fundamentalist uh, Southern Christian sect that he grew up in. Mm-hmm. And uh, he decided to go to a Christian college, and he went to a fundamentalist Christian college. And during his time there was in the 60s. So there's major things happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, People are protesting the Vietnam War. There is uh, situations with, um, you know, black versus white and and Mm -hmm. all the social unrest that was going on in the nation. And he remembers walking by his dean's office and his dean was there with white gloves on this was around Valentine's Day. Okay. There were those Valentine's Day candy hearts, you know, sitting oh, on the desk. Like, I love you. Yep. Or... And he's individually picking out the ones that students could use and the ones that students couldn't use. Oh, So if my it said, goodness. kiss me, gone. Yeah, that's, <laughs> out of that's there. too much. You know, ha- uh, love you, maybe that can go in the maybe column, you know, and he's there oh, my sorting goodness. out every individual <laughs> piece of candy. Wow. While, meanwhile, outside, there is craziness going on. I mean, people are literally being hanged. There is just wild things going on in the justice system and all those things. And he remembers in that moment, something in his heart going, yeah, something about this isn't right. Yeah. Uh, This made me think of Matthew chapter 23. Wow. Jesus is speaking to this kind of situation. He's speaking to the Pharisees. Mm Mm-hmm. Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you (laughs) strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. (laughs) Wow. That's a powerful picture. And basically, it's the same thing. Jesus is saying, listen, you're so worried about like every little piece of your kitchen spices while over here, there's a major matter happening yeah. that, that you need to deal with. Yeah. And, and sometimes if we're not careful, that religious spirit can creep in. Those veils of religiosity 
can creep into our lives and we can allow those things and begin to so narrowly focus on one thing Mm -hmm. while disregarding so many other things. That's so true. And and Jesus calls us to that, you know, take the, take the plank out of your own eye before you call out the The speck speck in someone else's eye. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about some of the walls, whether uh, maybe not physical, but just walls in our heart. Yeah. That we put up, uh, oftentimes, you know, maybe a, a national pride, mm-hmm. you know, a, a sense that like God cares more about our nation, yeah. or, or or maybe it's just a spiritual elitism that says like God cares more about me right. than He cares about you know some person in a third world country somewhere. Yeah. And maybe we would never verbalize those things or say them out loud, uh, but these are the things that want to build up in our heart, or maybe even a wall that builds up. In, in our lives is the idea that that I can, you know, earn God's grace, earn God's favor through right. my works, mm-hmm. you know, by the things that I'm doing. Uh, or, or another one that I, I see so often in the American church, and we were talking earlier about our upbringings. I, I saw this, uh, this idea of holiness by subtraction. Mm. You know, it can become a veil, a, a facade that that says like, well, I'm more holy because I don't do that. You know, people mm-hmm. say, well, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't date the girls that do. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's that idea of holiness by subtraction when there can be real issues in our heart. Right. You know, there could be pride, there could be uh, unforgiveness, there could be bitterness, rage, envy, yeah. all of the the, you know, the fruits of the flesh, but yet we can have we can have our eyes veiled right. to those more important things. Yeah, and sometimes we're so focused on theological or sociological disputes rather than the people that actually need help. Right. And and, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. Sometimes you've taken your eyes off the more weightier issues, the more weightier things and and what we want to do is just have a discussion as we close this session. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't want any veils. Like, like it said in that original text, yeah. uh, there are veils still that are covering hearts. And we don't want to be putting veils back on that Jesus never intended to be put on. Yeah. And so why don't we just have a discussion together and just talk about some of the things that, that we can do so that we can continue to have the power and access that we have in God's presence.